Now, I'm slightly scared as to how nice this is. It's, it's got everything that you need, right? The most interesting and fascinating ideas I find are often the ones that give you that mind blow moment when they connect two ideas that are seemingly different and unrelated and connect them together to give new insight. This video is about one such idea that links what we find delicious now and something that happened on Earth four billion years ago and using that information to help us make a more delicious mayonnaise and also, as always, to help you cook better at home. So to begin to understand why we can taste the things that we do and to make a stonking mayonnaise, we need to go back in time before life even existed. But deep below the oceans was a chemical system that was evolving and though it wasn't alive, it contains all of the molecules necessary for life and are the molecules that help us create delicious food today. Now this video is a matter of taste, rather a matter of the classes of compounds that we can taste. And these classes of molecules that we can taste are as important to our lives now as they were four billion years ago, because in all likelihood, it's exactly these compounds and these molecules that life emerged out of. So why can we taste at all? Well, if you imagine in the early bacterial world, it would be quite an advantage if you are able to sense and detect the molecules around you and maybe move towards the ones that you want, the ones that you need to replicate, or to move away from the ones that are bad for you, like poisons and maybe toxins from other bacteria. And given that obvious advantage, it's perhaps no surprise that the sense of taste was the first to evolve and is the most widely shared of all senses across all life forms, and even viruses. Now, viruses are, some consider them not to be alive at all, but they actually have the ability to sense and decide on their behavior given the presence of some molecules, which is bonkers. So let's get into it. We are somewhat audaciously making a mayonnaise out of the building blocks of life so that we can understand through taste the molecules that made up the original vitalizing soup and to seek insight into why certain foods are so delicious. So let's get into this and look at the tastes as we experience them today. So let's start with perhaps everyone's favorite taste, which is sweetness. Now, sweetness is the detection of sugars and these are in a lot of different foods. Like naturally, we can find them in a lot of fruits and we also get them in, in almost all processed foods. So adding sugar is a great way to make something more palatable and enjoyable and sadly cause diabetes. We have the taste of sourness, which is the ability to taste acids. And we find these in vinegars, in citrus juice, and we normally use these to brighten up a dish. Now the next one's a really important one and that's saltiness. Now I think perhaps out of all of them, salt is perhaps the one that we've got most experience with because we're very used to and it's a really easy thing to add salt to our food. And we have the taste of bitterness which I think is probably the most interesting of the taste because it detects a really wide range of molecules and this is the taste of ones that might be poisons so they taste bitter and we kind of when we're young we refrain from eating them and it's almost a learned behavior to enjoy these tastes and the body has learned that things that trigger these senses may be toxic and we may want to be careful about how much we eat. But we can absolutely learn to love them. You think of like the taste of coffee, the taste of really dark chocolate, uh, artichokes, green vegetables. These have many bitter compounds in them and yet they are some of our favorite foods. And we have the so-called fifth taste, which is umami. Now the original work on this sense and this, sorry, this taste was from Japan where a researcher had isolated MSG from seaweed and showed that it has a pleasing taste and one that we might think of as savoriness or deliciousness. Some of the latest research even suggests that we can sense fat, that is just the fat itself, not necessarily the flavors that they carry. Uh, and chefs will talk your ears off about how you need to cook in fats, be it olive oil or beef fat, butter, especially if you're French. Uh, and these carry so much flavor and impart so much flavor on the food that we're eating. They also provide a really good mouthfeel. So the creaminess and kind of luxurious textures that chefs often try and present uh, from fats, especially. Now I want to include one more, which is heat. Uh, personally, I think chili should be in almost everything that we eat. Uh, the sense and that warming sense that we get from chilies is really nice. And that is kind of a quirk. It's not a taste per se. It's a receptor that normally senses heat that is excited by the molecule of capsaicin and a couple of others that are related to it and send to the brain signals that it interprets as something being hot. Now those are the tastes as we experience them day to day when we eat and when we talk about food. But if you're a researcher in say chemistry or biology, then you'll understand these molecules a bit differently. And each of those tastes actually represents a different structural class of molecules. And each of those classes has a unique job to do in the body. So when we taste sweetness, then what we're tasting are sugars and carbohydrates. Now these have 
many uses in the body. So primarily they're a fuel. So if you're exercising or you know just existing, you need to have glucose. And related sugars, they are also plant cell walls. So cellulose is made from a polymer of starch, polymer meaning many of them join together. The individual sugars can also be used structurally. So in RNA and DNA, you have a sugar backbone and it's slightly different between the two, but it's based off the same sugar molecule. Possibly the most important one is umami itself. So umami lets us know about the presence of one of two things. We have amino acids and amino acids are the individual constituent parts of proteins. There are 20 of these that the human body needs. Some of them we can make, some of them we need to get from our environment. Now, every one of these doesn't have a taste. Some of them taste of nothing at all, but some of them do. And the one that we're perhaps most sensitive to is MSG or monosodium glutamate. This is added to a lot of different food. Uh, I add it to a lot of my cooking. It is absolutely a cheat. Um, you can just chuck this in something that was a bit average and then suddenly you get a bit more savouriness uh, and a bit more enjoyment out of that meal. Now, the other structural class that gives the sense of umami is nucleotides. Now, nucleotides are the N in DNA and RNA and they are the alphabet of the code of the DNA and RNA. So obviously incredibly important for the information side of biology. And um, without that, you don't get heredity and you don't get traits passed on. You don't have any instructions how to build proteins. So in the life sciences, there is something called the central dogma. Uh, and that is the system of DNA and RNA to produce proteins. It is conserved across all life. Anything that is alive, anything that interacts with the living system like a virus, relies on this process to make proteins through DNA and RNA. Now salt's an interesting one because it's a way for the cell to manage its metabolism and various other processes. So it's just something that can travel across membranes and it creates potentials and allows for the transfer of energy, but it's way more complicated than I can understand. If you, I will put up a screenshot a bit later of some of these cellular processes. Um, they're absolutely mad. Now fats are really important. They are insulation, both for us as individuals, if we're cold, it helps us to regulate our temperature. And they are insulation for nerves to make sure that the electrical signal in the nerves is maintained and can be carried longer distances. Now the fatty chains form something called a bilayer, which is the cell wall of animal cells. So they have an incredibly important structural element to them as well. And the last one that we'll look at to make this mayonnaise is acidity. Now acidity concerns itself with pH primarily and the pH of anything is a measure of the concentration of something called a hydrogen ion and the cell needs and any living system needs to be able to control pH in order to metabolize things properly uh, but also because there's a particular acid that is at the heart of metabolism in aerobic animals and also some anaerobic ones it's called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle and so for the mayonnaise, we're going to use citric acid. Very distinctive and it's going to be fun to use. So now that we understand the significance of taste and what it's telling us about the food that we're eating and the molecules that are contained within it, uh, I thought it would be fun to make a mayonnaise to kind of trigger each one of these and see if we can make something that is delicious through a route that you might not ordinarily explore. So we're going to do it in a way that it targets taste rather than aroma. So as a prime example, we're going to use citric acid instead of lemon juice because if I use lemon juice, then you've got all the lemony notes and things like that. And I kind of want to avoid that to keep it as much of an experiment about taste as I can and that kind of sensation of deliciousness and richness on the mouth. Now for the mayonnaise, we've got some egg yolks. Now these are the key emulsifier, granulated sugar, some salt. We've got MSG, some citric acid and the katsubushis. This is what it looks like. And we've got some vegetable oil. The first thing I'm going to do is to make a tea out of the katsubushi. So I'm going to bring some water to the boil and, and then I'm going to chuck these into it and let them sit for 10 to 15 minutes. And then that's going to be most of the liquid that I'm going to be putting into the mayonnaise to mix in with the oil. Okay, so for the mayonnaise, uh, we've got the egg yolks. So there's two egg yolks in here. And then next we've got the katsubushi stock. So this has got 25 grams of katsubushi flakes and that's been brewed like a tea. And so this is going to have the inosinate in. Uh, which is one part of the umami that we're looking for. And then we're also going to add MSG. So I'm going to start with five grams and just see where we get from there. Uh, I'm going to start with two grams of salt. So that's probably just over one gram of citric acid. Um, sugar. Well, let's put 
let's put eight grams in. <laughs> really no idea how this is gonna taste. So I'm gonna blend this with a stick blender. Um, it's a really efficient way to make a mayonnaise. You can just have it blending and incorporate in the oil. So I'm gonna add a bit more salt and I'm gonna add a bit more MSG. I think the citric acid is exactly right. I wouldn't wanna have any more acidity. It's, it's really quite pleasing. Um, and it's kind of a nice rounded acidity. Now, normally when you make a mayonnaise at home or in a restaurant, you're gonna put something that's got more interest to it, that it's got a bit of a kick or something. So like mustard, or you put white wine vinegar in there. Uh, you almost certainly use real lemon juice instead of just citric acid, which has got no other aroma <laughs> to it at all. Um, so given the remarkable simplicity of what's in here, I'm amazed at how satisfying it is. And it's, it, it scared me in as much as it's, it's kind of like hyper palatable. It's, 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 it's got everything that you need, right? It's got sugar to it, it's salty, uh, it's a bit of acidic for freshness, so it kind of like refreshes the palate almost. Um, and the MSG and the nose and eight, it's there. It's, it's a, a flavor that if you've experimented with, you'll understand, but it's just a scent. It's a real kind of deep sensation that you get from it. And it's got a lot of MSG in. <laughs> Maybe that's the trick, but wow. Um, it's not the best mayonnaise I've tasted, but it, it's in the same way that a fast food burger chain isn't the best burger you've maybe had. Like you can make a better one yourself, um, but this is really Moorish. So for me, that's been a really interesting process to go through and I hope you've found it interesting to watch along. And I really encourage you to make this mayonnaise at home so you can get a sense for what these chemicals do in food and that kind of experience of hyper palatability even though the food itself is not that nutritious. Now, as I said, you know, fast food burgers, while we crave them and we want more of them, we can make better ones ourselves. And so I want to use the lessons that we've learned from this today to make a mayonnaise that is equally Moorish and delicious, but in a way that's more natural. So we can still trigger these sensations and this kind of satisfaction that we get from these chemicals in a different way and we can also make it even tastier. So next time we're gonna be making another mayonnaise, but one that has a lot more complexity. So we're gonna be looking at other techniques to introduce flavor. Now, I hope you found this video really useful. Uh, and if you enjoy it and you wanna see more like this, then you know what you need to do. And I'll see you in the next video.